Uh, good evening and welcome to St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Ken Blythe, I serve Peter's pastor, and over the next three weeks we're going to romp through the Holy Land. Uh, the first two weeks we're going to look at places. Uh, we're going to look at how we get to the Holy Land, we're going to hear about my recent pilgrimage just a few weeks ago to the Holy Land, and we'll zap through various sites that you see in a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And then in week three, we're, I'm going to give you a deep dive into the proposed St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church pilgrimage to the Holy Land, which is likely to take place next year, 2024, um, at the very end of May and into June. Uh, even if you're not intending to come on that pilgrimage with us, it's still good to come to that class. Uh, because at the, in that class, you'll see how we plan a trip to the Holy Land. You'll see um, some of the nuts and bolts. You'll get some of the very practical advice about what to take with you and how to prepare for a trip to the Holy Land. So even if you don't come that uh, on our trip with us on that trip in 2024, you will have that opportunity to hear in class three what it's all about. And if we have a subsequent pilgrimage, you'll be prepared for it. Or if you hear about a pilgrimage elsewhere, by and large, what I'll tell you in week three will hold for that pilgrimage also. So it will be time well spent. Um, please be aware that if you can't make next week, we are recording this. And so you'll be able to see next week's once it's posted to the website. If anyone asks you, gee, I wish I'd been able to come to that class, but I guess I've missed it. I hope you'll speak up and tell them, no, no, it'll be online. You can watch it. And lastly, for those of you who are watching a recording of this after the fact, welcome also. And please feel free to call the church office if you have any questions, any concerns, or you want to speak to me about anything that comes up in the course of these three weeks. Okay. So the class today is very intensive in photographs, and that's great because we are tweaking our AV capabilities here in Ogram Hall this week and into next. And so if there's any class that we can run um, without missing the other technology that we normally have, this would be it. Because a lot of it is me talking, a lot of it is you uh, looking at photographs, and I hope occasionally sticking your hand up and asking a question. Okay, and that goes for you folks online also. If you want to speak up, please, please speak up. Okay, let's begin. And give me just a second to share this screen and to tweak things a little bit so that all works well. There we go. Now I'm just going to move some things out of the way. And I'm going to make that go away. And then I'm going to change this. Isn't this exciting, everyone? There we go. Uh, maybe not. Okay. I'll move that out of the way. At least for now. Okay. So I can't really start this without saying a big thank you to the group that took me to the Holy Land on my last two trips. Um, it's a Masonic organization. Uh, and as you know, most of the Masonic organizations, in keeping with all of those fraternal societies, have particular um, charities that they support. You think Masons, you think the Shriners. You think the Shriners, you think hospitals. Uh, the Knight Templars are a very small relatively, in comparison, small Masonic group, and their charity is sending Christian clergy to the Holy Land for the first time. Very few requirements attached to it. Um, they ask that you be credentialed with some denomination. They don't care which. Uh, they ask that you be in congregational ministry so that what you learn in the Holy Land uh, can impact a congregation in your preaching and your teaching. Um, they also say, look, you need to be physically fit to do this. And this is true of any trip to the Holy Land. Unless you have a particularly specially arranged trip uh, that specializes in just a few sites and helping the less physically able to, to navigate the sites. No, you don't need to be able to run a marathon. You don't. But you need to be able to walk four or five miles every day. 
And no, you don't walk the four or five miles, like starting now and then at the end of the four or five miles stop. No, no, it's four or five miles of stop, start, get on the bus, drive somewhere else, get off the bus, walk to a site, walk around a site, and they're archaeological sites, folks. So there's always a wall, usually a 3,000-year-old wall to lean against. There's stones everywhere. There's always a rock to, to perch your dupa on for a minute or two, you know, and just take the strain off. And some places there are benches. Uh, so when we say five miles or four miles or six miles, we mean in total in a day from, you know, eight in the morning to five at night, and we mean stop-start. The other good news is there are lots of restrooms everywhere. As a man of a certain age, that's all I need to know. And yes, you'll be encouraged to stop at every restroom while there's an opportunity. When an opportunity comes, grab it. You see a restroom sign, use it. Okay. So the Templars send uh, pastors over the Holy Land. It must be the first time. They're not interested in a retirement gift to a local minister or priest, uh, they, they want this to be your first time trip. And they cover all your expenses, every dime. They fly you from your town to Newark or JFK, the flight's over, the hotels, all the meals, the tips, the taxes, the fees. Sure, if you fall in love with your Israeli guide and want to uh, give them um, a little bit more, then that's great, but their tips are covered. Uh, the the bellboys that take your bags from the front desk up to your room and back down again, they're covered. They're, they're all this included. is being recorded. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So that's why I wanted to spend five minutes explaining that. Oh, and I should say how you get chosen. Um, the local Masonic groups are invited every year, hey, if you know a minister or a priest or a pastor in your neighborhood that fits the bill, send them. Men, women, black, white, everything. Just there is no precondition. In fact, the more denominations in the group, the better, because you're, you've got that diversity to, to bounce ideas off of each other. And the more diverse the male-female mix is, um, and folks of different color, it really enriches the trip when you've got a very varied group. And so that they do that every year and have for the past 40 odd years. Um, I, they, I went on my pilgrimage with them in 2019. And then after that, they invited me to come back as a, an associate host. You've got an Israeli guide and Israeli driver, but two Americans from the organization come along and, and they make sure you're safe. And the junior guide is the one that is the caboose and brings up the tail end. When the Israeli guide sees the assistant guide, he knows everyone's there and he can start his spiel. Um, and I'm going back again uh, in February of 2024, just a few months ahead of the SAKLC trip, to bring up the caboose with the Knight Templar group yet again. So hats off uh, to the Knight Templars and their Holy Land pilgrimage. Now, um, everyone thinks they know Israel, but they don't. Um, this is an incredibly small country. I mean, the Israeli Air Force can't open the throttle for more than a few minutes because they'll be over a border. Um, and an Israeli fighter jet can fly from their base in the Galilee to Damascus in about four minutes. Uh, to, to give you an idea of some size, there's one hill, one mountain in Israel that has a ski slope, and you have to be very careful going down it, because if you take a wrong turn, you'll get to the bottom of the hill and you'll be in Syria by mistake. You know, this is a small part of the country, very small. But, but here's an idea of how it's made up. You can see Egypt, you can see Jordan, okay? You can see Syria. Let's start up there in Syria. You see this shaded area, the, the horizontal, the diagonal stripes between Syria and uh, the northern part of, of Israel? That's the Golan Heights. 
um, a mountainous range or a hilly range that separates Israel from Syria. It's disputed territory. We'll get to this later in the presentation today, hopefully. Um, but uh, there was a, a battle fought to push the Syrians off the heights in the Golan. Syria has that, um, that uh, eastern slope and the Israelis have the mountaintop and the western slope. Because I can tell you, you can stick an artillery piece on the top of the Golan Heights, and it could be an old World War II artillery piece, it's still going to hit houses in Israel. Now, go south a little ways. You'll see a, a color completely different from Israel and Jordan. That's the West Bank. You hear it mentioned on the TV, nobody ever shows you a map. That's the West Bank. Um, it is occupied by Israel um, to an extent. Uh, the makeup of the West Bank, other than the Israeli settlements, uh, um, are Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians have their own police force and municipalities. Um, Israel has military oversight. Uh, this is um, this is the Palestinian territory. If you hear about the Palestinian territory, they're talking about the West Bank. Okay. Um, there are border checkpoints um, between Israel and the West Bank. Uh, you will see Israeli helicopters, uh, but the police in the area are Israeli police. This is the Palestinian Authority, the PA. That's that area. Um, and the rest is Israel, except for that little strip, which is why it's called the Gaza Strip, that little strip on the Mediterranean between Egypt and Israel, but on the coast, bless you, that's the Gaza Strip. Uh, that is uh, Hezbollah territory. That's, that's, um, that's, a, that's an into the building. Just, just off. You can get it again. I know. I got it already. Okay. Herb, Herb, I need you to mute yourself. You're coming through to everyone. Thank you, sir. Um, that's the Gaza Strip. That's a horse of a different color. That's that's a very dangerous territory. Yes. So is Israel bigger or smaller than Florida? Much smaller. Oh, much smaller. Considerably smaller. I'm looking to see if there's a if you if you look at if you look at this um, if you look at the scale if you look at the scale down at the bottom oh sorry for the people home the question was what size are we looking at here in comparison with Florida if you look at the, the scale down at the bottom left hand corner you will see what forty miles makes up don't be don't be confused with kilometers that's the scale that that little bar is forty miles long. Lay a few of them, you suddenly realize how small Israel is and how narrow it is. Because, yes, I mean, from, from the very tip where nothing much goes on in the south to the very north, those 40s are up a wee bit, but not to thousands. But lay that 40 miles east to west. Yeah. Okay. Um, of that, uh, all sorts of, of wonderful things happen. And I didn't have time today, but I'd like to be able to print this map off for you, because this is the Israeli map for the Christian traveler. We'll show, I'll show you better maps as we go along, as we journey around the Sea of Galilee. Um, but this gives you some idea of biblical Israel. There's Judea and Samaria. You see that over, over in, the, in the east? Incidentally, if you see modern day Israelis, talk about reclaiming Samaria, Samaria and Judea. That's the West Bank. You see that? If you have that image of the West Bank in your head, okay? That's the West Bank. That's disputed territory. That's currently part of the Palestinian Authority territory. Um, now you see how words are loaded. But Israel will claim that, many Israelis, because that's the biblical land of Judea and Samaria. Okay. Um, I think it might help to have that map 
as a handout, especially given the distance chart at the bottom left-hand corner that gives you that ready reckoner to tell you the distances between some places. But I wanted to put that up just to give you that idea. If you look up in the north, you'll see Galilee. If you look uh, to the central part of Israel, you'll see Jerusalem. Now you see, although I've just said it's a small territory, now you'll see back in the day of Jesus, when everyone traveled by foot, or if you, re if you had some money and you wanted to risk it, you could try sailing down the Mediterranean. Um, now you see how far Galilee is from Jerusalem. So when the passion narratives say of Peter in the... Um, in the courtyard of the, uh, the of, of uh, Caiaphas's palace. Incidentally, next week I'll show you a photograph of the courtyard in Caiaphas's palace. One of those few places we know for sure that if the New Testament is right about what happened, that's exactly where it happened. You can stand in the courtyard of Caiaphas's palace. It's not very big, and you know you're somewhere close to where Peter denied ever knowing Jesus. But remember, they say to him, you also must be a Galilean because we can tell by your accent. Because the Galilean accent is that sort of country accent. It's not part of the build-up metropolis of Israel. It's not a Jerusalem accent. Uh, the, the closest you would get in American parlance is that hillbilly accent. You're from Galilee because you can tell by that accent. Now you know what they mean. It's way up there. But look at that part of Galilee. That's where Jesus spent 95% of his time. And I don't mean 95% of his life. He had a three-year ministry. And except for a few weeks, he spent it up there in the Galilee. Just occasionally crossing the border into Samaria. But 95% of what Jesus did was done in that little part up there in the north. Only when he strikes out for Jerusalem, he has a little bit of a journey there, and then he has some time in Jerusalem, a short time in Jerusalem, before he's killed. You can stand on a mountain in Galilee and pretty much go, and you've seen where Jesus spent 95% of his ministry. Now, different times back then took a while to walk but still a relatively small number of miles. At some point, I'll figure out what it is I have to do. There we are. When you fly into Israel, you fly into Ben-Gurion Airport. David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister of Israel, um, was a leader of the, of the, uh, of the Israelis um, as the British mandate, as man mandatory or mandatory Palestine, came to an end. Uh, after World War I, um, the, we remember that we defeated, we, America and Britain, defeated the Germans. Well, that was only half of it. We were also at war with the Ottoman Empire, which when it disintegrated, reduced back to its core, which is modern day Turkey. Uh, the Holy Land was part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries and centuries and centuries. The Palestinians in, in, in Palestine had no self, haven't had self-rule for centuries. Um, you know, they, they were always under the yoke of someone. And then for the last several hundred years, they were under the yoke of the Ottoman Empire, which were allied with Germany in World War I when the Ottoman, when the Germans were defeated, the Ottoman Empire was defeated. The Brits had no interest in Palestine whatsoever, except the French wanted it. And so the Brits didn't want the French to get it. Plus, if you're going to have uh, part of an empire over there, isn't it neat to have the Holy Land? So somewhat reluctantly, because the Brits captured it from the, from the Ottoman Empire, um, they kicked the Ottomans out and it became uh, part of the British Empire, but not permanently part of the British Empire. The League of Nations gave Britain a mandate to govern uh, the Holy Land. That's why that period is called mandatory or mandatory Palestine. It's the British mandate, which ended in 1948 when Israel got its independence. And David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister. So the national airport is named after David Ben-Gurion. 
you're in an international airport. And no matter where you fly from in the US, that's where you're going to fly into. It's the, it's the international airport in Israel. It has the added advantage of being very close to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is a very modern city. It was just marshlands infested with uh, mosquitoes. Nobody wanted it. Several brothers got together, bought it, and it's now a metropolis on the Mediterranean. I did have a lovely photograph of the beach, and I accidentally, accidentally deleted it about 25 minutes ago. Amy will tell you that I need adult supervision at all times, and by George, she's right. The saying in Israel is that you go to Jerusalem to pray and you go to Tel Aviv to play. It's, it's got, it, it looks like any city on the Mediterranean, um, but all those big expensive tower blocks on the beach, when they have to be pulled down, there are no tower blocks getting built in their place. When Tel Aviv was laid out, all of the streets were laid out so that the streets, not the houses, the streets face the Mediterranean. So that cooling breeze that comes in off the Med goes downtown and you don't need any air conditioning. And then rich people came along and said, let's build, build big tower blocks on the beach. They built them. And now the breeze hits the Mediterranean side of the tower block and nothing gets downtown. It's stifling. Having learned their lesson, too late, but learned the lesson, uh, they... The Israelis quickly passed a law that said, okay, we can't tell you to knock these multi-million dollar things down, but when they've served the lifespan, you're knocking them down and you ain't building anything where they are. And downtown Tel Aviv will get that natural air conditioning coming off the Mediterranean. However, historic downtown Tel Aviv is one of the UNESCO sites, the United Nations sites of, of great historic importance. And it's because of the white city. And that's an example of the white city, concrete. The early Israelis loved concrete, you know, and concrete buildings went up everywhere and the concrete is white. It's called the white city. And there's a prime example of it. And so this is typical of, uh, of what makes old Tel Aviv um, a UNESCO site. Okay, so you would not stay in a hotel. You would stay in, you wouldn't stay in a building like that. You would stay in a lovely hotel. Very often, folks, pilgrims that come into tell into Ben Gurion Airport, instead of driving a great distance after getting off a 12-hour flight, 12 hours from New York, JFK. Um, mo and, and by the way, you get in in the evening. It's an overnight flight. It takes off from from uh, JFK at about 11:30, quarter to midnight. You fly 12 hours. There are six or seven hours, I forget which, ahead of us. So by the time you get through customs, immigration, onto the bus and to the hotel, it's time to check in, splash water on your face and go have dinner. You'll have traveled two days to get there. The day it takes you to pack your bags and get to JFK and the overnight flight and getting to the airport. Luckily enough, the hotel that SAKLC will use is down by the beach in Tel Aviv. So it's easy to come out the hotel, walk half a block, and you've got a whole host of restaurants, walk along the beach, stretch your legs before turning in for the night. Other advantage of staying the night in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, millennia before Tel Aviv was built, the port city of Jaffa or Joppa uh, was in existence. Now it's a southern suburb of Tel Aviv, but it's a very different suburb. This is what, this is what Jaffa or Joppa looks like. You know, that's, um, that's what it looks like from the sea. See, that's not a 1930s uh, invention. That's the old port city of Joppa or Jaffa, depending on uh, what year you, you come from. Why is it famous? Um, it was on the beach at Jaffa that the whale spewed up Jonah, according to the book of Jonah. Um, it's also a city that... Peter visited often. And in the book of Acts, uh, we learn about Peter visiting um, the Tanner's house. That's where Dorcas was from. Yes, this is, and this is, the, this is the Tanner's house. And why is that such an important thing to remember? Tanners were unclean. So Peter's ministry starts in the house of someone that no good Jew would spend time with. 
Why do you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> well, tanners discovered before you mix, now there's chemicals that will do the job, but the chemical that did the job back then in the tanning process is urine or urine, depending on how Americans pronounce it. So if you have a job working day in and day out with, how do Americans say that word? Urine, good. It's the Brits that say urine. Urine, you're not out, you're in. I'll remember that. Um, that made you unclean. And so there's Peter starting his ministry in the book of Acts and he's staying in the house of a tanner. You know, start as you mean to continue. So that's why, that's why this site's nice to see. And to be honest, who wouldn't love that? I mean, doesn't that look like an Italian, you know, Mediterranean city? Yeah. So there's nothing else to see there, but that's a nice, easy start. If you get into Tel Aviv early enough, you can go from the airport and do Joppa, Jaffa in an hour and get the blood flowing to your legs. And if you get in too late, well, then you walk on the beach and the next morning on the way to the Galilee, you stop for an hour in Jaffa. Okay, everyone does it. Okay. Oh, went too far. Um, this was bigger in my mind. <laughs> but this shows you where things are. Um, uh, we are going to show you uh, one of the, is it the next stop? Or, yeah, the next stop is Caesarea Martima. You see it there in big letters above the word Mediterranean. That's where we're going next. And you see Joppa. Uh, Tel Aviv doesn't exist at the time of this map, so Tel Aviv isn't up there. But just imagine Joppa is, is, like I say, it's a southern suburb. So just imagine that that's really Tel Aviv. And a few miles away from Tel Aviv is Ben Gurion International Airport. <laughs> so the first day is a drive from, um, from Joppa to Caesarea Martima. Which is what that, this is what Caesarea Martima looked like in the good old days. Um, you can see at the bottom the Roman theater. You can see um, just above it and to the uh, the west, the Hippodrome. I'm asking you to concentrate on that because they still exist. You'll clamber over them and sit in them. Uh, and then to the north, you see the aqueduct. Um, that's still in existence. I'll show you photographs of that in a, in a bit. But then you see downtown the Temple of Augustus. You see the great lighthouse. Um, why is it in ruins when it was such an important city? Great question. Thank you for asking. Um, Israel sits in an earthquake zone. Um, very few buildings in Israel fall over because the Israelis have incredibly strict building codes. So that uh, uh, the the earthquake that hit Turkey uh, back at the uh, the end of January, start of February, uh, which they were still recovering from when I went on my pilgrimage, um, it was almost as big a, a hit to Israel, and Israel just crushed it all. And one of the reasons that Israelis are so strict with their building codes is that almost the entire population of Israel live in apartment buildings. Very few people have, you know, the mansions that, that we have here. Um, you see them here and there. Um, as your guide will probably say, it's all politicians. <laughs> They're the only people wealthy enough to buy these things. Everyone else in, uh, uh, all the normal folks in Israel live in apartment buildings. You don't see anything that looks like big American buildings except when you go into Palestinian cities and towns. And the reason that they have things that look like mansions is that the whole family lives in that big house. Um, as you drive through Palestinian neighborhoods, you see what looks like mansions. The ground floor is mom and dad. The next floor is son number one. The next floor is son number two, son number three, and their wives and their families. If you look on the roof of a house and you see rebar sticking up, you know that there are unmarried sons living at home. If you see the roof 
somewhat finished, it means all the sons have been married and they're all living there. And in case you wonder, yes, the mother-in-law rules the roost, even over the wives of the sons. But they're big, impressive buildings, and you think, wow, they must be very rich Palestinians. No, there could be dozens and dozens and dozens of family members living there. Pal uh, Israelis, uh, Jewish Israelis don't live like that. They live in, in apartment buildings. So you could wipe out the population if your apartment building isn't earthquake-proof, or at least earthquake-mitigated. Okay, yes. This area today, is that all apartment buildings? No, that's all ruins. Although near Caesarea Martima, uh, because it's such a nice part of the country, there are luxury villas popping up hither and thither. But they're wealthy, they're wealthy Israelis. Only people that can afford to, well, and the only people that can persuade the government to give them that land. And then the only people that can afford to, to, to build a house. And no, that's not where they live year round. That's their like, you know, the Russians with their Dacha, you know, that's the Dacha, that's 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 their weekend getaway. The rest of Israel lives in apartment buildings. If they don't have sons. Then that's the people that tend to have very that's the Palestinians that have small houses. <laughs> which you know, which is an economic thing. It's I mean it's purely economic. Your daughter will marry and move in to her husband's family place. So if you don't have any kids, you can afford to get a small place. That's And of course, I'm painting with, um, you'll find exceptions to everything I'll say. I mean, you can't describe an entire country um, or, or, um, or tribe of people and, and cover them all in one sweeping generalization, but vast majority. Okay, so um, this uh, Caesarea Martima, um, a lot of the glories fell over, just fell over in earthquakes. And then we rebuilt some of them, and then they fell over again. And at that point, people just took the stone and made other buildings with it. It's common. You see that everywhere. Even in America, some of the, you know, um, go to Williamsburg and they'll say, yeah, some of the stone there was really used to be in the early houses over there. People, you know, unless there was a quarry nearby, you reused, reused the stone. There is the amphitheater in Caesarea Martima. And you can just about make out where the rest of things were, at least the downtown bit over by, by the sea. Um, are these your photographs? No. Oh, sorry. Yes, I should say that. No, they're not. <laughs> um, because my most recent pilgrimage, I took about 10 photos. I was working, you know. I was teaching and I was counting heads. And as I said, I was the caboose. Um, so no, at the time I thought, I'm not taking a lot of photos. I can get better ones off of Google. In fact, once or twice, you see a copyright sign come up. And it was just too good a, a, a photo to, 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 to not use, even though there's a little copyright. Yes. Uh, the walls. Um, those walls you see, that's a modern photograph. So what you see is still there, there. No, that's in the sea now. Parts of it you can see in the picture there, but, but only the surviving fragments of it. Now, this amphitheater is great. They still, they, Israelis put on shows every year, act house. You can stand on the, um, you can stand on the stage part. Um, the stage part, oh, I really do have to stand up. I left my pointer. I, I did have a pointer. Yeah, I had a pointer. Um, I just couldn't see the point. I'm here all week, try the veal, tip your waitress. Uh, that's the that's the stage there. The expensive seats are around there. The cheap seats are elsewhere. Um, uh, that's back of stage, and you can stand on that stage. the 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 senior host, my boss on those trips, um, he's quite an accomplished singer. Uh, he goes and stands on that stage while everyone bills around, and then at a signal. He starts to talk conversationally, no amplifier, you can hear him in the back row. And when he sings, he says, I'm not doing an operatic voice, I'm doing a church hymn singing voice. You could hear every breath he takes. Okay, this is the Hippodrome. Um, no, they did not race hippopotami, um, but that is the, the, the Latin word for horse. 
uh, the derivative of Hippo. This is where they did their horse racing. Um, your, your chariot goes up one round, round way around the other. Uh, this was straightforward. This is a very typical horse racing design. The oval keeps, and it's it's actually more, it's like a stretched oval. Um, so you get a good bit of speed going up on the straight, and especially with the chariot races, then navigating that turn to go round. Actually, now that I've said that, I'm not sure which direction where they went round, but whatever way they went round, uh, you had corners. And that's where the skill of a rider or a chariot uh, driver uh, would come in real handy. You can see um, some columns at the top of that photo up towards the, in the center, up towards uh, the Mediterranean there. We'll see a close up of that in a minute. Okay. Um, this was not the place where you had gladiatorial fights. Wrong shape. Um, you know, if you were at one end of that, and they actually shortened it at one time. They could, you could see where they shortened it uh, to, to be able to do more things in it. Uh, because if you wanted to have a, glad, a glad, gladiator fight in the middle, um, the people at either end couldn't see. It wasn't designed to see all the action in the middle. It was designed just like a racetrack now to see the boom, there he goes, you know, and oh, he comes back again. It wasn't designed to, oh, I shouldn't do that sitting on a high chair. Um, it wasn't designed to, to see the action in the middle. Um, another claim to fame of Caesarea Martima, um, this was the base of Pontius Pilate. No, Pontius Pilate did not live in Jerusalem. Um, no Roman governor would want to live in Jerusalem. You got an office in Jerusalem, you got a villa in Jerusalem, you've got a barracks, the Praetoria in, in Praetorium in Jerusalem, but the governor doesn't live there. Why would the governor want to live on the top of a mountain, uh, or at least on the top of a hill, in the middle of the country where it's hot and surrounded by people he didn't like? He went there when he needed to go there. He lived in Caesarea Martima. This is a replica. The, the original uh, uh, slab is in the Jewish Museum. This is the only archaeological proof that Pontius Pilate existed because his name's on it. Um, we also know he exists because I think Pliny writes about him and the Jewish historian Josephus writes about him. But this is the only piece of, hold it in your hands, evidence of Pontius Pilate. And I'll tell you what the sign says, um, and it's fragmentary. And of course, you don't know what the piece on the right says. So the top line says, to the divine Augustus, this Tiberius, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has dedicated. It's not Christian propaganda. This is a great find for the Israelis. It's got pride of place in the, in the Jewish Museum in Jerusalem. But the textual evidence that Pontius Pilate existed. Latin. So, so Caesarea Martima, I mean, just think back to that. I mean, there's a happening place with an enormous harbor where you can unload goods and soldiers. You got the breeze coming in from the Mediterranean. You got all the entertainment a man could want. That's where Pontius Pilate lived. He, he visited Jerusalem. Now, remember I said uh, in this slide, Look at the pillars up at the top there towards the, the, that's them in the background. That's them up close personal. Uh, it's, it's really neat to be able to walk around there and walk around the ruins of Caesarea uh, Martima. Oh, by the way, especially uh, when it comes to Caesarea's Martima on the coast, Caesarea Philippi further north. Two different places, not just same name, same place, different times. Caesarea Martima, Caesarea Philippi. Okay. Caesarea Martima. No, oh, I don't actually know. It's probably, it, it's, I'm sure someone figured it out. I mean, because of its grandeur, it's some kind of public building. Uh, maybe the remnants of a temple, uh, maybe the remnants of, of a gathering place. Um, I'm sure someone knows. By now, they've figured it out. 
uh, but that someone isn't me. It's a great question. Now I wish I knew the answer. There's the aqueduct. Um, this is not reconstruction. For 1400 years, it was buried in sand. All the archeologists had to do was move the sand out of the way. It was just an enormous sand bank until someone discovered there was an aqueduct in it. And it goes for miles. It brings, I mean, you're on the Mediterranean, but that's salt water. That is where most Israelis get their water now. Massive desalination plants in the Mediterranean, sucking water out of the med, taking the salt out of it and making it into drinking water. And they couldn't do that back then. Yes, sir. Now, yeah, a lot of Israel for a long time, Israelis were capturing rainwater. Um, and some, and you still do for irrigation, and sometimes for uh, through a series of pipes on the roof that will warm it up and it saves your electricity bill. But a lot of the drinking water is from the Mediterranean. Enormous. I mean, it's like it's like driving through Texas and seeing all those petrochemical plants. Uh, you drive up the med. You see these plants, but they're desalination plants. Um, this, so, but you couldn't do, see, uh, there was no desalination process back then. So you needed to bring fresh water from somewhere. Um, this brings fresh water from Mount Carmel, where we're going to look at next. And it brings it from Mount Carmel all the way down, multiple miles to Caesarea Martima to supply the water to the, to the city. And because the sand just went up against it, and because the earthquakes, it withstood the earthquakes, everyone just abandoned it, people forgot it was there, and lo and behold, the archaeologists discover it and go, this is the easiest archaeology in the world, you just move the sand. <laughs> you don't have to put things back where you think they were, it was, it was just there. When did they discover it? Um, I think it was, to be honest, I think it was back in the 40s. Um, but Google that. <laughs> Don't take that word. You probably know me by now. If I know the answer to something, I'll speak it definitively, even if I only learned it an hour ago. But but if I don't know, I'm honest enough to say I don't know. But it's relatively recently. Yeah. Um, this is Mount Carmel. Okay. That's, yeah, that's where we're going next. Uh, Mount Carmel is famous because that's where Elijah... Um, did his voodoo stuff that's very disrespectful that's where elijah prayed to the one true god and brought down fire and wiped out all the prophets of baal and um, who were trying to tell him that his god was you know and he says nah my god is the one true god elijah brought down fire from heaven and uh, all the prophets of baal were wiped out and there is a a modern statue to elijah up there and there's also well, what would you think would be up there? A Carmelite monastery. It's an order of nuns named after Mount Carmel. So that's on top of Mount Carmel, and that's where the water for Caesarea Martima comes from. And this is the monastery atop Mount Carmel. This is one of the views from Mount Carmel. Um, I wonder if the, no, there isn't a, I didn't get it. Uh, I wish I had. Um, when you go up mountains in, in uh, Israel, you see other landmarks from it. And most places will have an observation deck with a panorama that has the, you know, this is Mount Tabor, this is Nazareth, this is Mount Mora, you know, there's, there's the Jez Jezreel Valley. Um, these are important places. Mount Tabor we're going to see next, that was where uh, the transfiguration took place. Nazareth, well, we know what happened in Nazareth. Uh, so that you can't, there's no view in Israel that doesn't have something significant um, in the distance. The trick is just knowing what it is. And that's where the handy dandy tourist panorama comes in. Uh, by the way, you see those mountains, you see those valleys, that's valleys are, are where crops grow and valleys are where wars are fought. No one in the right mind fights on a mountain because they're notoriously easy to defend and notoriously difficult to breach. So, yet yeah, has there been fat battles on mountains? Yes, even at Gettysburg, a little round top, you know. But 
you don't go, you don't fight hill or mountain valleys, a uh, uh, hill valley, hill wars battles if you can get away with it. They're fought on in valleys, and the more strategic the placement of the valley, the more likely there is to be a war. So much so that there's one valley we'll get to shortly that is um, the, 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 the battle place par excellence in this life. And the biblical witness says there'll be a battle par excellence there at the end of times as well. But I will get to that. There is a concertina door at the bottom of that ramp. Could someone, could someone close it? I, sh I should have thought to do it, but... It, it does, it latches closed and it will keep the, it will keep the sound. I apologize. I thought it was a small group in there tonight and I didn't want to look rude. Okay. Um, now we're on to um, tell Megiddo. So Megiddo, this is a site uh, and tell means hill, usually artificial hill. Because if it's a real hill, it's Mount something. But a tell is a name for a hill that usually refers to an artificial hill where people over the years have added to the pile in order to create, put a temple on top or a lookout position or a palace or a shrine or an altar or something important. And some of the tells are so big that they actually put communities up there. No, funnily enough, that's the exception to the rule. Tel Aviv is named. Tel Aviv is named after a book, um, and I, I won't get into the intricacies. But no, it's not a tell. No, it's a. It was a swamp. It was a, a, a sandy, hilly, swampy mosquito area before the water was all drained to make it habitable. Good question, though. But yeah, exception to the rule. I before you accept, have you? Um, now. This site is important because it has fantastic remains, which we'll get to. But it's also important because it's at Megiddo. And there's a valley at Megiddo. Um, now, let me just pronounce this properly. Excuse me a second. Um, an ancient name for a mountain other than Tel was Har. So this was Har Megiddo which got bastardized into Armageddon. So the Valley of Megiddo is the Valley of Armageddon. It's a confluence of a couple of valleys, some strategic mountains and a hill like Tel Megiddo. Battles were fought there all the time because in history, when you find a good place to fight, it not only means that it's a good place to fight and it's a strategic place to fight. So you find in history all over the world, battle after battle, taking place in the same place, century after century, because it's strategically important. That valley had so many battles that in the apocalyptic writings, that's where the, bat, the final battle, good versus evil, will take place. Um, at Armageddon, at Har Megiddo. This is Tel Megiddo. This is the, this is the hill overlooking uh, the valley of Megiddo. So it's an important place. You can see the ruins. That's a wonderful lookout point. Um, and you can take photographs from down below, looking up at all the tourists or from up there down. Um, oh, just um, habitation, houses. But people don't go there to look at the houses. Um, if you've got a strategic position that you want to defend, there's, I mean, other than an army, weapons and ammunition, there's two things you need. You always have, you always will. You need water, you need food. This is how they got the water. They dug an enormous tunnel. I mean, enormous. You can walk through it, it's creepy. It goes all the way down. It's scary, there's lots of steps. Uh, a guide will tell you exactly how many steps down and how many steps out. And if you don't want to do it, there's a shortcut around to where the bus will pick you up. But if you're a hardy soul, you'll go down, you'll go along. Um, this, is, this is where they got their water. Their food, on the other hand, they stored underground in a thing like this. They stored it in jars. There was no point in just tipping the, the, the grain down. Because apart from anything else, people owned the grain that was in there. 
And so you got a pot, you put grain in it, you put a, um, a, a shard of pottery with your name on it, and you tied it to your pot, and it went down there for a rainy day. It doesn't show real well in this photograph, or maybe it does. It's in the eye of the beholder. Because you're carrying containers of, of um, grain down, and you've got to come up to get out, and you may be carrying some grain out, you don't want to run into the person carrying it down, and if you're carrying it down in a hurry, there's no space to pass each other. So they did, they did a corkscrew down and a separate corkscrew up. So you've got a one-way street going down and a one-way street going up. Ain't that clever? Yeah, that's glorious. I love that. Okay, so where, where are we at this point? Um, there's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you can see where Nazareth is and you can see how far Nazareth was from Mount Carmel, from the monastery at Mount Carmel. Um, by the way, Nain... Uh, you, the bus doesn't go through Nain, uh, which I think is actually pronounced Nain. Um, but that's where Jesus raised the widow's son. Uh, Jesus was walking past Nain and wasn't even in it. And a funeral cortege comes out and it's the widow walking behind. And Jesus knows that's her last or only son. She'll have no man. And he takes pity on her. And he puts his hand on the, on the casket in the funeral cortege, and brings her son back to life. That's, that's the village of Nain, Nain, okay? Um, but there's Mount Tabor, and we're going to Mount Tabor next, I think. Yes. I'm looking at my cheat sheet. There's Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is the scene of the transfiguration. Um, and you can see what an impressive place it would be, and by George, they built an impressive church. Now, a lot of these churches are not terribly old. Um, there's some churches that were only built on holy sites in the 60s. There's some churches that date back to the 40s or 50s. There's some that date back to the 1800s. There are very few churches in this neck of the woods that are ancient. So that's the church on Mount Tabor. That's it, a little more close up. I happen to like it. I like symmetry. It's a symmetrical church. Amy rolls her eyes at this point because she knows that I like symmetry. And if something doesn't match something, I'm like, no, no, we have to move that. N doesn't have to be symmetrical. <laughs> but I like that church and Amy isn't here. Yes. Do they welcome Christian churches in Israel? Yes, very much. Now, there is some friction between some extreme Israelis and uh, not just the Arab Christians, because of course, most of the Christians in the Holy Land are Arabs. They speak Arabic, they stand in church and shout Allah Akbar, because the Arabic na Christian name for God is Allah. There's, there's no other Arabic word for it. The Christian God for, you know, you walk into a Lutheran church in Jerusalem, They'll be praying to Allah because that's the because Arabic is their native language and the word for God in Arabic is Allah. They say Allah Akbar because God is great and God is good. Christians shout that all the time. But boy, it makes you nervous when you're <laughs> if you don't know that's what they do. And of course, that has a whole new a different meaning for us. Um but but the, the Holy Land sites are um some of them are Lutheran, a lot of the Catholic ones, they're the the custodian of the Holy Land is the Franciscan Order, um, the Terra Sancta, uh, the Holy Land. Uh, they oversee all the Catholic churches, and then the Orthodox oversee their, theirs, and the Armenians theirs. But with the with the Israeli government, there is very good relations, and and the building of a of a Christian church, even on a Jewish site, which I'll show you later. Yep, I may just have time to show you later. Uh, we're going to see Magdala which is Mary Magdalene's, Mary of Magdala, her hometown. Um, and it, this just illustrates, I'll, I'll answer your question now because it's a great question and I'll probably forget in 10 minutes. Um, there was a, a, um, 
religious order, a, 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 a Roman Catholic priest that wanted to build a guest house, uh, chose a place to do it, started excavating to build the guest house, and discovered the synagogue in Magdala from the time of Mary Magdalene. And the Israelis said, stop, <laughs> we're going to excavate, and when we're finished excavating, we'll see where you can put your guest house. And by that time, he said, well, I'd actually like to build a couple of churches. Is that okay? And, and this is back in the 80s, the 1980s. And the Israelis said, sure. As long as we know there's no, nothing old underneath it, if it's just dirt, go. Back. So there's a church 100 yards away from the synagogue, the remains of the synagogue from the time of uh, Mary Magdalene. Perfect way to answer your question. Yeah. Now, there are extreme Israelis. Uh, just about six months ago, they desecrated the Protestant cemetery in Jerusalem. Uh, on Mount Zion, there is several leftovers from mandatory Palestine, the, the British mandate. One of them is an enormous Presbyterian church. I, when I was on my first visit, uh, I stayed at the Mount Zion Hotel, got out of the bus, looked over, and there's this castle, just like 100 yards away. And I go, Castles flying the Scottish flag from the from the top of it. Just for you. Just for me. It's not. It's the Church of Scotland. It's a, a memorial to the Black Watch, which turns out to be the local regiment in Scotland where I come from. Um, and it's a Presbyterian Church of Scotland. This Church of Scotland supplies the minister to that church. There's also on Mount Zion, there's a, a Protestant cemetery dating back from the days of the American colony, there's an American colony from the earliest days of modern Israel. Um, there's a windmill. It didn't work out quite as they thought it would, but there's a windmill. Um, and so the, the Protestants from that earliest time up through the British mandate are buried there, including all the British soldiers that died um, of disease or in battle or fighting the, the Arabs or fighting the, the, the Jews. Um, and Jewish extremists came in and desecrated that cemetery, toppled over. Uh, and there's also some unruly groups of extreme uh, Jews um, that occasionally the, all the churches in the whole in Jerusalem in the Holy Land will get together and issue statements um, from the Pope's representative and including the Lutheran bishop of the evangelical the evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. That's our that's the group we relate to. Uh, and they try and issue statements in the name of all the bishops and patriarchs of Jerusalem. And occasionally our, our bishop will, uh, over in the Holy Land, will jump in with a uh, and sign that document saying, you know, maybe the Israeli government isn't doing it, but some Israelis are, and the government needs to get a grip on them. But otherwise, the relationship is very good. Um, this is the scene of the Transfiguration from the Church of the Transfiguration on top of Mount Tabor. Now, this gives you a, an overview of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Magdala we'll, we'll have a look at. Tiberius we'll have a look at. Roughly, what's the, the circumference, like the, the circuit around? I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. I'm just curious. You know, it's it'll, those one town to another. It, it'll be e eminently Google, Googleable. Um, but but I don't know, and of course the quick way is to take the sea, but uh, the sea the Sea of Galilee is big enough, and the the uh, the temperature of the water and the cool air coming over the mountains uh, makes it pretty unruly during the day, which is no matter what people tell you, that's why people fish on the Sea of Galilee at night. There's an old wives' tale that says the fishing is better. It's not. It's just less dangerous. Because, because the cool of the evening, there's less of a temperature differential between the, the air coming over the, the hills and mountains and, the, and the, the temperature of the water. It's just a lot calmer, less prone to storms than it is during the day. And it is big enough that you can get caught in a really bad storm. Uh, this is a typical tourist boat. Uh, this is identical, may even be the same one that I've been on a couple of times and that the SAKLC group next year would go on. It gives you plenty of places to sit, a little bit of cover in case it's wet, but you're otherwise able to look around and just see the sights that Jesus would have seen, you know, because the hillsides haven't changed much. 
You know, cities and towns will, but when you're looking at mountains and hills, you're pretty much seeing it the way Jesus saw it. And by the way, the Galilee is very green and very lush. Um, I got into trouble once saying that the Galilee reminded me of Scotland. And someone says, oh, you see Scotland everywhere. It did remind me of Scotland, but it will remind, but it will remind you of Wisconsin. And it will remind you of any place you come from in America where there's nice rolling hills and it's grass. And you look out at the Sea of Galilee and it just looks like a big lake. It will. I mean, you, you're you not going to say this looks like Scotland. You're going to say this looks like wherever you know that looks like that. But it's not barren desert. Those hills are a little greener than they look. Yes. Um, here's a little uh, uh, overview, too. Uh, that's the Sea of Galilee. Um, those buildings at the bottom by North Denisar, um, that's where I stayed a couple of times. SAKLC will not stay there. That's a kibbutz. And so the accommodation is not quite SAKLC worthy. Perfectly good. I loved it. I'd go back there. But I know, I know some of y'all might not appreciate life on a kibbutz. It's a very nice kibbutz, but it's a kibbutz. Um, by the way, the kibbutz movement has now gone entirely capitalistic. As you know, most of Israeli history is, is socialist. Uh, the first 40 years, 50 years of, of government in, in Israel was very left-wing. Uh, the Zionism, the kibbutz movement, they're all branches of socialism. Most of the early settlers that, that, that came before um, the First World War and between the wars um, were committed Zionists. Uh, David Ben-Gurion and his, his uh, government uh, socialist to the core. The kibbutz movement is now, there are some old school kibbutz around, but they're largely capitalistic now. And so this kibbutz has a whole hotel and guest house system going, but there's also people that live there. When I went to, to North Ginnisar, I'll show you uh, a boat from the time of Jesus that's in a museum there. And when you come out to visit the restrooms, there was a whole bunch of kids that had got off school at that point a bunch of the boys were in soccer kits. They, they were just about to go and play soccer. They were getting a Coke before they went. So there are real people live there. Um, but SAKLC uh, uh, is going to stay somewhere else at a resort um, on the Sea of Galilee. That's a little nicer than the accommodation in the kibbutz in North Ginnisa. But I show you that because we are going to go to that kibbutz to see the boat. And you can see where Capernaum was. Bethsaida, we'll see that. The Golan Heights there indicate that just the top of that hill is Syria. Well, it would be Syria if the Israelis hadn't grabbed it to, for, for security purposes. But the slopes on the other side of the Golan Heights, uh, that's Syria. Okay, this is the boat. A um, couple of Israelis, uh, it was a drought year. The level of the water in the Sea of Galilee was low. They stuck their hand into the mud, found a whole bunch of nails. They knew instantly they were Roman nails. Uh, what were Roman nails used for around the Sea of Galilee? They held boats together. Um, this boat was excavated, and now it's preserved. And it's a boat from the time of Jesus that fishermen would have used on the Sea of Galilee. How did they get it out? They brought experts in. As they moved the mud out of the way, they kept it wet. And then someone said, let's excavate underneath, and then let's just spray that foam stuff all over it. You know, that foam that hits and then goes whoosh. And then someone said, how do we get it out? And they said, well, foam floats. So, so once they got the foam all the way around, it was totally encased. They just pushed it out and towed it to dry land, brought it into a climate controlled area, took the foam off and were able to clean it up a little bit and then preserve it. Because when water, when, a, when wood has been wet, for 2,000 years, because it had been wet, for it's a 2,000-year-old boat. Um, once it dries out, it turns to dust. You've got to keep it wet until it can be preserved. And when it's preserved, you know, it's just like a thin film of wax over it. And it looks pretty impressive. And how, about how big is the boat like in length? Couldn't tell you. Google it. Google it. <laughs> um, now you see where Tiberius is in relation to Capernaum. Um, and Magdala, and Chorazin. See Chorazin at the top? 
Uh, we're going to see that because you'll visit it. Uh, that's famous because that's one of the cities that Jesus cursed. His, his, his gospel wasn't uh, welcomed there. I think, is it the book of Mark? Mark? No, Matthew and Luke. Um, that was one of the cities that Jesus cursed. Um, and there's a fine remains of the synagogue there. So we'll be seeing that. So that gives you an idea where things are, okay? Um, this is a boat in Tiberius. I also had a nice photograph of Tiberius, and that one I deleted three hours ago. <laughs> uh, Tiberius is a lovely city. It's right on the banks of, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. From, from my room at the kibbutz at night, I went out with a small bottle of wine. Well, it was small when I was finished with it. Um, <laughs> and, and I sat on the deck, and I looked over the, the edge of the Sea of Galilee, looked over to Tiberius as it was getting dark. And when you see cities, as it gets dark, you start to see the headlights of cars, the street lights, the house lights. It was special. It was special. And Tiberius is right there. Jesus never visited Tiberius. He didn't visit it because it was built on a, a graveyard. Um, no good Jew would go into Tiberius. Um, but uh, near Tiberius, on the outskirts of Tiberius, is where Peter did, uh, uh, made his great confession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, He, he briefly thereafter, or shortly thereafter, screwed it all up by, by, by Jesus, when Jesus told him, uh, and, and I'm going to die and rise again on the third day. And Peter says, no, 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 you're not. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. But just before that, Peter made his great confession of faith. It was on the outskirts of Tiberius. Why am I showing you that? That is Peter's fish. Everyone who visits Tiberius, there is only one thing on the menu, Peter's fish. You can have it filleted and in light batter, or you could have it the way God intended you to eat it. But one way or another, you're having Peter's fish. Uh, and that's what it looks like. And you eat that. In we do visit Tiberius, and that's where you eat Peter's fish. What kind of fish? Can't remember. Google it. Google it. You have very good questions. I wish you'd ask me something I know the answer to. I don't know. What is? What do you think that looks like? Caramel. We'll Google it at the end of the class. And then all these questions I don't know, I'll get our new AV guy to let me say, well, that's a great question. It's a insert name of fish here. Okay. <clears throat> Where are we after? Oh, this is the Mount of the Beatitudes. This is the Mount on top of which Jesus delivered his uh, Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. And uh, just the other side of that church is a slope that forms a very natural, not amphitheater because it's not really seats to sit, but just an acoustic little concave area where you can really talk and be heard. And do we know that that's really for sure where he delivered the Beatitudes? Do we know that Mount Tabor is where the transfiguration happened? Um, do we know for sure? No, but they're, they're, they're educated guesses based on the, on the topography, based on the scriptural evidence, based on tradition. Uh, it's a very fine church. I like this. Um, a nice wraparound porch at the front where you can really look down into the valley. Um, and inside, uh, there is, a, you see the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the stone, the pavement, the, uh, the, uh, there's a word for it, mosaic. Um, each side of the altar has one of the Beatitudes. And as you walk around, uh, you sort of, you pray and you worship the Beatitude. That, that altar is in the middle. That's why the tabernacle is such an odd shape, because you can view the tabernacle and adore its contents as you go around the inside of the building. Does it say on the Google? Which has written on the Laos TB Christi. Laos, L-A-U-S. There you go. Thank you. Good enough to Google that one. Now we're back to the Sea of Galilee just to get, to get our bearings again. There was Tiberius. We're going shortly to, to Magdala, and there's Capernaum, there's Corazon up at the top. 
it's all kind of falling into place now. Um, this is uh, Corazan or Corzum. It's got four or five different spellings. This is the site of the place that Jesus cursed. And this is the synagogue. Cursed it. Cursed it because his, his uh, gospel wouldn't, message wouldn't be received. Uh, Corazin, Corazan, uh, uh, there's another version of it. Uh, you pay your money, you take your choice. Our tour group uh, names it uh, Corazim, C H O R I Z or Z uh, M. So that's that's the the synagogue. There's the synagogue from above. It's it's a really interesting little place. Um, this is the Moses seat from the synagogue in Corazim. Um, this is the seat that the 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 rabbi or the teacher would sit down on and it's the place of honor, the seat of Moses, and you would teach from there too. So when it says that Jesus was in, not the synagogue, but Jesus was in the synagogue, asked for the scroll of Isaiah, unrolled it, quoted Isaiah, rolled it up, handed it back to the attendant, and then sat down. He was likely sitting on the seat of Moses. And, and there it is from, not that Jesus would have sat on it because he cursed Chorazin, but that's from the synagogue in Chorazin. Now, off to Capernaum. Please pronounce it Capernaum. Every pilgrim that goes there pronounces it Capernaum. Uh, it's not Capernaum, it's Capernaum. And that's Capernaum. Um, why is this famous? This, is, uh, G this was Jesus' home base for quite a while. Um, this was the richest, biggest city in the area. Um, the, it's strategically placed on the pilgrimage route through Galilee to go to Jerusalem. And a lot of the people that owned guest houses and cafes and stores that sold stuff to pilgrims going down the main drag lived in Capernaum. The, it was obviously wealthy. The engravings, the carvings are out of this world in that place. Obviously rich people. But rich people attract ordinary people too. Um, Peter's mother-in-law lived there. Um, we know that Jesus was there because he raised Peter's mother-in-law from the dead. Um, the house of Peter's mother-in-law is there. I'll show you it in a minute. When we were um, there, there was a lot of construction going it's, on. Um, it's just absolutely lovely. And you walk around these ruins, and I'll show you more um, as we also. Oh, but just have a look. Um, the church above Peter's house, the synagogue, there, there are things you're going to see in a second. That's the modern church. You can tell it's modern. It looks like a spacecraft. Why does it look like a spacecraft? Because they wanted to dedicate a church to Peter above Peter's mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law's house. And they didn't want to destroy Peter's mother-in-law's house to do it. So they built the church over it with a glass floor so you could look down and see Peter's mother-in-law's house underneath it. And there it is. So let me just flick toward to these a couple of times. Isn't that amazing? And the supports holding all that up are strategically placed so they're not destroying anything archaeological. Archaeological digs were, were, were done where each support would go to make sure that they could put the support and not destroy anything. It's taking up space, but it's not destroying anything. And, and that seems to me the best of both worlds. You might not care for the architecture, but when you remember what it's doing, it's straddling an archaeological site. I, it's nice. I think it's nice. It's often closed because they do a lot of worship there. And you pay your money, you take your chance. You arrive there, and if you're there for an hour and there's a two-hour worship service going on, you're, you're out of luck. Nine times out of ten, you'll breeze in and be able to see it. But this applies to everything in Israel. If, if you have bad luck, you have bad luck. You know, it's not planned that way. There's no mulligans. You just lick your wounds and you go on. Uh, there's the synagogue. Isn't that beautiful? Just, just beautiful. Um, this is this is downtown. This is the this is downtown Capernaum. Um, these are houses and stores. Uh, it's really quite a sight to see. Literally, it's an archaeological site, and it is a sight to see. Oh yes. 
almost everywhere in Israel is still being excavated. There's almost nothing that's, ah, we've been there, seen it, done it. This is Magdala. Um, those photographs you see around the edge, in fact, if you look at the far right-hand one, that's the photograph of the guy who wanted to build the guest house and then discovered the remains of the synagogue. That's what that is. Um, and so his guest house is around the edge of that. And the, the Israelis actually allowed them to put all this Christian, all these Christian photographs. Um, there's a photograph of the Pope coming to bless it. There's all this kind of stuff. So back to the question about how do the Israelis get along with, with Christian sites? They let him build a couple of churches we'll see in a minute. They let him build his guest house and within feet of the ancient synagogue at Magdala, um, there's photographs of the Pope. Um, now, one can argue whether there should be photographs of the Pope that close to, and I love Pope Francis, but um, you know, some of us looked and said the Christians could have been a little more discreet about that, given that the Israelis were playing so nice. Uh, there's a little bit of that's in your face, but hey, if the Israelis didn't object, why should I? <laughs> so that's the synagogue at Magdala. Remember, Mary, Ma Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. This is her hometown. This is her synagogue. Uh, there it is, just from another angle. And you can see that, that the photographs, um, Christian photographs are around it. The glass behind there is uh, is the guest house. Um, beautiful mosaic. Uh, it's remarkable. The Israelis will let you walk over 3,000-year-old mosaics. And the reason is that that's not paint. That's different color stone. You're not going to wear that color off. So I'll be darned. They let you traipse over all sorts of, uh, of um, uh, mosaics. Well, depends on how heavy the pilgrim is. <laughs> Once in a while, I half expected them to look me up and down and go, "Could you just walk around the edge of that one?" You feel comfort, you know. Yeah. Um, this is the synagogue, and it's such a sensitive site that they've they they're keeping the elements off of it. Um, this thing in the middle, um, uh, I did have a better photograph of that, so I may be out of order. That is the receptacle for holding the Torah, and. This one has a claim to fame. Um, the engravings around it all reflect actual ar uh, architectural features of the temple in Jerusalem. The artist who carved that, if he didn't carve it and schlep it to Magdala, he carved it from memory, from things that he saw in, in the temple in Jerusalem. This is more of Magdala. This is this is not the synagogue. This is not. Uh, this is part of downtown Magdala, the 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 living, the working part of Magdala. Um, uh, so it, it's a work in progress. It hasn't been covered, but you do see a dig over the right hand corner there that is under work. This is the Catholic Church at Magdala. That's the altar. The top of it is perfectly flat to serve as an altar, but since you're looking at the Sea of Galilee behind you. They built, a, they built a boat for the altar. There are also uh, the 12, well, the 13 disciples are depicted um, around this church, including Judas. And you know it's Judas because he doesn't have a halo. But they included him. And there are little chapels off of the, the, uh, uh, the, the vestibule that are dedicated to women in the Bible, because this is the hometown of Mary Magdala. The when they when the Catholics built this church, each chapel, each side chapel, and there are several of them, are all dedicated yeah. to women in Scripture. Those um, pictures not there. No, those are uh, icons, but in the side chapels, the artwork is mosaic. I, I I'm, I'm 90% certain, but those are not, those are icons. And I can't remember now what the, the apostles' ones are. Very famous painting now, that's in the Crypt Chapel at Magdala. Um, you can buy that one in Joanne Fabric now. This is, this is the woman touching the hem of his garment. That is powerful. 
Now you might not, you might disagree. You're allowed to. I mean, this is art. It's in the eye of the beholder. I can't look at that without tearing up. Incidentally, this was the altar. So I'm on pilgrimage. I walk down the stairs. Remember, I said this is the crypt. I walk down the stairs. Father El Yatim, the assistant of the Bishop of Florida Bahamas, a man who's preached here, is standing behind that altar consecrating holy oil. Off to the left and right are pastors from Florida and pastors that used to be in Florida that I know. Dick Michaels, one of my buddies who's now back in Gettysburg, I think I'll go over to Dick. They're all anointing their, their, their pilgrim group. And I just surreptitiously slip it. Father saw me and smiled and waved. And Dick Michael, Pastor Michael, Michaels, looks up and there's me. <laughs> and we've known each other for 25 years. He bursts into tears. He's anointing me through tears. I get a phone call later that night from Khadr saying, what did you do to Dick Michaels? He's been crying all afternoon. Yeah. 10 days ago, I get an email from Dick who says, I've just got the video of my pilgrimage. They caught me crying as I anointed you. I started crying again watching the video. <laughs> but isn't that a powerful one? And you can buy this painting online, versions of it. I think that's really powerful. The woman, the hemorrhaging woman, touching the hem of Jesus' garment and being cured by just touching him. Isn't that great? Superb. It's interesting, oh. though, because, um, it, I mean, the, the, the skin is darker than, say, mine, something like this, but it's still not what I would think of as uh, proper Jesus colored skin, if you know what I mean. All of all of skin. I mean, yeah. when, when Father El Yatim preaches here, he was born and raised in um, in Bethlehem. Uh, when Gabi Alabuni came here to preach, he was born and raised in Nazareth. Um, you know, the, the it, it it's a typical Mediterranean skin color, swarthy but and depending and depending on what you did for a living, yeah. Well, it depends on what you did for a living. There's a a, a text in the Old Testament, um, where where uh, and I can't remember. I, this is the only fragment I know. It says she was black but beautiful, and you think, wait a minute, that's awfully racist. But she worked in the fields. She was black, meaning. Very, very sunburned, swarthy, you know. Um, but despite working all her life in the in the sun, she was still beautiful. It's nothing to do with whether she's black, white, or indifferent. It was a reference to what she did for a living. I can't, I don't know. It's modern because I mean it was only done in the eighties or nineties, but it's all over the internet. It's much loved. It's just incredible. You can. You can, but everywhere we went in Israel, they were selling copies of this. It was, you know, it was a big thing. But you can get it off Amazon. It's, uh, you can download it free off Amazon. I didn't say that. Okay, um, we're now in da, uh, Tel Dan. Uh, Tel Dan is mentioned in the. It's where the tribe of Dan first settled. It's mentioned in Genesis uh, because Abraham hightails it. He chases the kidnappers of Lot through Del Tan. And yes, it is a, a tell. It's a, it's a mound, it's a, it's a real tell. Um, it appears in Judges as well. And there's a great shrine that's there. I'll show you a photograph in a minute. Um, according to uh, Second Kings, I think it is, um, it's a descendant of Moses, who is the high priest at, at this shrine at Tel Dan. Oh, but that, that shows you what was going on there. Outer uh, gates, inner gate, outer gate, a throne platform, high place of worship. Show you that next, because you can see it all around there. Um, and there it is uh, from above. There's the, that's the, um, that's the high place of worship. You, you see it here to the left of the tree in the middle. And there it is close up. This was the one of the highest places of worship that wasn't Jerusalem. Um, this is a place of worship that might even predate Jerusalem for the Jews. Um, fell into disrepair. This is the most northern part of the old biblical Israel. Because you, you know, uh, 
we, we would say in English from high to low. I searched high and low. Um, yeah, they would say from 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 Dan to Beersheba, though that's the the extent of the kingdom. So this is a, a very famous place. Beautiful. Now, now we're on to. Um, Now we're on to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is that town that was famous. It was very unclean. And one of the reasons it was unclean was there was a sanctuary to Pan there. Okay. So you can see all these ruins. There's they're still are they're still digging uh, marketplaces, houses, public buildings, but this is a claim to fame, the sanctuary of Pan. Now just imagine these sanctuaries because the next slide, unless I messed up, Lord knows it's possible, uh, you'll see them now. So now we're, I, I, I tell a lie, we're now moving on to Benias, the Grotto of Pan, see that? Right, next, um, this is the Golan Heights. If you remember back an hour and a half ago when we started, I said, look up north, that diagonal colored area between Syria and Israel, said the Golan Heights. This is a close up of it. Um, the heights are commanded by Israel. The Israeli side is part of Israel. The other side of the heights, just a little safe distance away, um, is, is Syria. It used to be that it was U UN peacekeepers that were up there, and um, the 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 Israeli nickname for the UN is the useless nations. Um, I make no comment. I'm just telling you what they say. I've had friends that served in 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 the United Nations and in, in military units. I had one friend that narrowly escaped uh, climbing on board the plane with Dag uh, Hammarskjöld, uh, the the UN Secretary General who died. There's a friend of mine who's in this, and actually a mutual friend of mine and Dave Morgans, uh, who does the music here and in the choir. Um, and he was with the Swedish army in the UN when the when they were assigned to guard the Secretary General of the United Nations who died in that plane crash. And my friend and uh, uh, D uh, David's friend narrowly escaped climbing on board that plane. So United Nations used to occupy the high ground. Uh, they proved to be unreliable guards of the high ground. And so you see under Golan Heights, Israeli occupied. That's what those words say. Uh, you can see the Golan Heights from that kibbutz. So where I was sitting, admiring those lights of Tiberias, I was within shell range, artillery range of the Golan Heights. If anyone asks you, why did the Israelis grab it? It's good for nothing. There's nothing that really grows there. They didn't want it for minerals, oil, or vegetation. They wanted it because artillery pieces on the Golan Heights could easily shell. I could hit Israel uh, with a, a World War II artillery piece from the Golan Heights. Okay, and this is a trip. Uh, the, the SAKLC group will go here, um, up on top of the heights, and just see and see the world around. Uh, you can see the Israeli flag. Uh, there's depictions of battles the Israelis fought in order to, to occupy the Golan Heights. Um, now, we're we're on the on the downward slope. This is only going to take a few more minutes. Um, this is Bethsaida. Uh, Peter, Andrew, and Philip, according to the Gospel of Matthew, this was their hometown. In the uh, sorry, Gospel of Mark, Mark describes the the call of the disciples and uh, Peter, Andrew, and Philip. Are from are from here. Beautiful. You can still see the paths, um, the carvings, both in the synagogue and in public uh, areas. Incidentally, in synagogues, uh, ancient synagogues, you'll find all sorts of strange stuff in there, like zodiac signs. And the the theory was they they just allowed any artwork as long as it wasn't against the Jewish faith. So it's not that you find a, a, a synagogue and say, oh, there's a sign as a zodiac. That must have been used for something else. No, the 
the, the people that worshipped there must have thought the zodiac signs, the you know, the stars looked cute. Hey, who wouldn't want something nice carved in the wall? It was nothing religious. It was nothing. It wasn't ancient devil worshiping astronomy. But but you'll see that in in synagogues, and you'll think, well, what were they thinking? Lastly, Yardanit. Okay, good. I'm only a couple of minutes, and this is the last slide. Last couple of slides. Um, this is in the Jordan River. Now, um, yes, this is where everyone goes uh, to to reenact their baptism. When, when I was there uh, in February, there were eight ELCA pastors there with us. Just happened. Well, actually, no. A couple of them were NALC, North American Lutheran Church. The rest were ELCA. They knew I was an ELCA pastor. They said, we'll be safe with you. Can we renew our baptism vows in the Jordan? I hadn't planned to go in. It's freezing cold in there. Freezing. Nobody does anything once they go in except. But then when a bunch of pilgrims who are Lutheran pastors say, would you do that? You say, yeah. And they wanted to come to me because a lot of the other denominations were rebaptizing. Well, we don't rebaptize. I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. So they didn't want to accidentally go in with a group where someone was baptizing them. They, they were happier with a Lutheran who knew it was a, a renewal of baptismal vows. And we did that. We stood at the banks of the river and I did my best to recite Luther's great baptismal prayer from memory. Close enough. Close enough. Hand grenades, horseshoes, Ken Blythe doing Luther's baptismal prayer. Close enough. Um, obviously, there's no organized worship service or baptismal rite organized by the Masons. It's not a religion. They don't have a theology about this. So whenever a group of clergy go, they look to the guy in charge and say, well, what are we going to do? And he says, I can't tell you what to do. The Masons don't have a stance on this. I'm a Methodist minister, but you don't have to follow the Methodists either. Go do what you guys do. You know? And that's also why there's not a lot of worship services, because it's a disparate group of pastors and the Masons don't have a worship service. So if they laid one on, it would just be whatever denomination the guy running it is. In this case, he's a Methodist. And, you know, he could easily start preaching and offend half the group. So it's a case of each site you go to, there's scripture, scripture related to that site. You hear from the Israeli guide about the site. And there's always time for you to go off and pray and contemplate and, you know, do what you need to do. But when the Masons take you somewhere, there can't be worship because, you know, they don't have a worship service. So same with the baptismal rite. Yes, Gail? Does the Jordan ever warm up? No, not much. But that leads me to the conclusion of this. You will read about Yardani. They will say it's fake. Depends on your definition of fake. I hate to sound like Bill Clinton. It depends on what fake is. Um, I, you know... The River Jordan is polluted. There's not much of it left because they take it for irrigation and such like. Um, so to create this baptismal site, yes, it's the River Jordan. If they take all their paraphernalia away, the River Jordan will flow through this. It'll be about this deep. It'll be like about that wide. Um, so in order to get the river looking like that, I'm looking to see, yeah, yeah they build a dam. And, um, and then they clean the water, they filter it a little bit. So you don't get a disease when you go in to, to baptize. And, and yeah, they planted, they planted local shrubs and stuff around it. So it depends on, is that fake? You're not going to go in. The, the, the Jordan's just a little spelly river. Uh, you're not going to go in it to do that. But like I said, if you take the dam away, that's where the Jordan will flow by. So they've dammed it up so it's wider. They filtered it so you don't get some incurable disease miles from home. And they've built changing rooms. Turn it into a <laughs> no, they don't let you swim in it. They're going to heat it, that's all. They're not, they're not going to heat it. So what they do is, your tour, I mean, you, you, every pilgrimage, 
the price of admission is you can get in, walk around. There's no charge for that. 10 bucks gets you a towel, a big white baptismal robe to wear, and access to the hot showers. Best 10 bucks you're ever going to spend. If you don't want to go in the water, you don't have to pay to get in. Um, if you want to get in the water in your skivvies, they'll let you, but they won't let you swim about. They want you to do it prayerfully. Um, but they, but you, you don't get the towel and you don't get, uh, you don't get a hot shower. Um, and lots of people don't go in the water. They just want to see it. Or fully clothed, they'll step down and stick a bottle that they've taken with them to get some Jordan water. Yeah. Um, but anyone that goes in, it's worth 10 bucks to get a nice outer gown so you keep your uh well your, your skivvies because you've got to get back in the bus you put your swimming gear on underneath it you pull it over it hides your embarrassment you don't reveal your shortcomings that's by david niven joke um and then when you get out of the water you've got a hot shower you've got a towel that you didn't have to schlep from the hotel with you there we are that's that's uh sort of uh a third of the way through through a uh pilgrimage next week we'll romp through the rest because we won't i won't have that introductory uh stuff we'll just dive in we'll say and here we are at any closing questions um, oh, yes. yes there's and that's what i mean by the definition of faith you know it's it's enhanced it's it's made it's made safe um and and it really is it was the first site to do that which is why everyone goes there and pretty soon another site will open up somewhere else. Uh, but they'll have to do the same thing. They'll have to dam it to make it deep and wide, and they'll have to clean it somehow. Yes, Lou, close. Um, Google says Peter's fish in the form of tilapia. Thank you. <laughs> See, that's a nice fish to eat, isn't it? <laughs> tilapia. Okay, so in conclusion, um, uh, the food there is wonderful. It's Mediterranean cuisine. There's nothing particularly quintessentially uh, Israeli. They share the cuisine with the Mediterranean world, and you eat well. And any tour group worth its while, and certainly the SAKLC one, all the meals are provided. So you can quickly arrive, sit down, and be fed and watered in 45 minutes. It's just family style. They bring out the food. They pile it on the table. When it gets low, they pile more on. And, and it's a wonderful way to eat your way through the Mediterranean. And then you can work it off by swimming a little bit in, in the Jordan River. In restaurants. Yes. Gail. Um, next week, by chance, are you going to say anything about Golgotha? Yes. Cool. Yes, because Golgotha is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, in fact, several of the last stations of the cross are in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Calvary or Golgotha, they're the same place. It's just place of the skull in Latin or place of the skull in Hebrew. Uh, Golgotha, uh, Calvary. Um, the, 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 place, the tomb of Jesus is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The stone slab on which the body was, was laid to prepare for burial was there. The place of the Three Marys, where they watched it from, is there. Um, yes, Golgotha is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem. How are you with your we had 31 pilgrims, two guides, a driver, and a, an Israeli guide. Once, once you get beyond, you can get 40 on the bus. You can get 40-odd. You can get almost 50, I think, on the bus. Um, but larger groups start to get unwieldy. It takes you a long time to get off the bus. Although they're luxury buses and you, there's two doors, front and back. Um, but it just becomes unwieldy getting people off the bus, on the bus, from A to B to C to D to E. Um, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll take more than 20, but there's a point and, you know, it would be a nice problem to have if more people want to come. But there's a definite cutoff because after that, you get a sort of law of diminishing returns. Uh, that group of 30 was manageable. Um, 40 would be manageable. 20 to 25 to 30 is a kind of sweet spot. Thank you all.